Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Ask, ask. No, Anything actually, you want to stop and ask, ask yeah. anytime. In RS200, the coolant is provided over here. Yeah. So, uh, regularly, how we can check it? Because the fairings are there, so. Yep. Yep. Some, as you mentioned, that, you know, uh, some bikes it's not easy to check the level of coolant level. So, I would say. See, coolant yeah. level is there, but mm. how to check the, uh, check the leaks? Leak, just, there'll be a drop. It'll drop down. Okay. It's green in color, you can see it. Yeah, it's visible, you know, it'll be all. So greenish basically overnight if you park your bike somewhere overnight is a good 8 10 hours if it's leaking you'll see at least two three drops then you'll know so this thing just put your uh, you know flashlight of the cell phone and move your bike like this you can see it moving the fluid all right and becoming one with the bike becoming one with the bike see for example you're riding rs200 and all of a sudden you rent a motorbike from driven you have to spend time about say 30 40 kilometers or 50 kilometers understanding a motorbike because every motorbike will have different levels of you know brake friction the clutch would be different clutch friction as you know where you're engaging it the motorbike the way the motorbike handles the traction of the tires and the way the gears shift so you have to spend enough time with the motorbike before you start pushing the motorbike because in the end, in an emergency, it's only a second nature that saves you, right? You don't think and say, okay, I'm braking now, I'm doing this. It's a second nature. So spend time, it's not just that, okay, I'm taking CBR 650F from here. Bar jate ke, pow, like, you know, be very careful with that. Spend enough time, become one with the motorbike, because in the end, man and machine, you become one, and then that is how it becomes your second nature. So, anything, anyone wants to ask till now? Okay. Understanding uh, bike is also important now. What happened was I had from Driven I took uh, uh, this Ducati Scrambler mm -hmm. and I was not aware about like if I if I ride in city traffic it will become like there was uh, like too much overheat mm -hmm. so I had to stop I had to get down True. and then get back True. Uh, on that True. so I was not like really aware like uh, character of the bike character See, of the bike, bike so that's that's where I yeah. went wrong yeah so like someone's riding the Duke 390 for the first time he'll think oh shit this is overheating this is heating up a lot but it's common, you know, it's a high compression engine. You keep riding, you don't do anything. So understanding a bike, you know, bike has, every bike has got its own character. Similar bikes, you put two similar models, they'll still behave differently. You know, the braking will be different, everything will be different. So that is where, uh, like, as you mentioned, you know, uh, knowing what are the warnings, what, what will the bike heat up? Is it normal heat? Is it abnormal heat? So that is another thing. All right, next point. No depending on electronics. Yeah, now this is what I believe in and I think even, you know, he can put a few points. See, these days, everyone, even on, you know, big reviews, videos, TV, what they recommend? Buy a bike with ABS, traction control, this, that, you know, future they'll say buy a bike which rides itself also. No, that is not the way to go because in the end, we want to be riders, correct? Yeah. Huh? We don't want to play a video game. So what I say is that today, Anyone can buy a motorbike with, it could be, say, S1000RR. Go buy S1000RR right from 150cc and put it to highest traction level, highest this level, highest that level, highest ABS. You can ride the bike, but you're not really learning anything out of it. So I am someone who always advocates saying that learn on a bike, like say if the RS200, with no electronics. Don't, don't care about it. That is where you start understanding the friction level of a brake lever. You know, you, you know that you don't have ABS. You know that you have to depend on your braking ability. And uh, you go to Duke 390 or you ri ride the CBR650 if there's no traction control, right? So how do you, you get onto a uh, surface which has got sand, how do you open the throttle gradually? So if you get onto S1000R, put it to highest traction level, you bang open the throttle, nothing will happen. Computer does the work. So learn the hard way. That is when, that is when, when you graduate to a bike which doesn't have anything, you know, turn off all electronics, you'll still be a rider. You evolve as a rider. So I'm not saying ABS is bad. I'm not saying electronics are bad, but they're good when you upgrade, you know, when you graduate to them. So it's like, you know, for a simplest example, you learn driving a car and you learn it on an automatic transmission, ABS and everything. You haven't really learned to drive a car. You only learn to steer it. That's it. You know, and someone puts you onto a manual control, you're done. 
you can't you cannot drive because you don't even know how to uh, engage the clutch so that is the thing next emergency contact huh getting emergency contact information yeah emergency contact information we, we all go on solo rides right or even group rides put your emergency contact information in your wallet in your uh, you know it's uh, actually some jackets come with a pocket where you put in your blood group you put in your name your you know emergency contact phone numbers because in case unfortunately we have a fall and we are knocked unconscious then sorry paper yeah yeah this also you can show you know there is the, we, all our cell phones are logged right so in case someone wants to see your last calls and call someone your parents or someone so they won't be able to unlock your phone to check your password so there is some app i'll let you know if you press the home screen it gives you emergency stuff right behind there but at least simplest way put a sticker on your motorbike right here you know it really helps on your motorbike one on the jacket or at least in your wallet keep your emergency contact at numbers at least you can have a wallpaper yeah i'm um, say in case phone be toot gaya or something like that you know keep it in your wallet just in a plain paper write it emergency contacts so that it's critical because someone has to be informed right so that is another thing next repair kit puncture kit yep so this is irrespective of the motorbike any bike we got to be self reliable you know we got to know basics like you go on a ride best the super buy best super bike go on a ride small puncture you don't know how to fix it you know it's not just embarrassing but you're not helping yourself so learn basic things like how to fix your tire punch it's very easy first time it will sound very complicated but it's really easy i got videos you can google others have got videos and carry a basic emergency kit like a tire punch kit okay which you know in small bag you can do it and put it around and uh, things like uh i mean i carry stuff like i carry a multimeter or i carry a tow line and what not but at least minimum a tire punch kit because the bike's engine could be amazing very reliable but any anything can get a puncture and you're stranded and you're done so that is important you know basic emergency stuff next no speed ride taking it out on big bikes this is you know uh, this point is low speed riding and taking u turns on heavy motor bikes is a challenge it is like say you're riding forget zx 14r and all that but even a z800 it is so heavy it's some 230 kg and the bike is tall so when i went for a test ride for the z800 when i was taking u turns i'm 510 but still you know i was not able to flat foot i was I, you know uh, like kind of tiptoeing and when you're taking u turns most of the u turns have sand and gravel so <laughs> that is where you have to be very careful how to you know when when we have the steering completely to the right or left when you're taking a u turn and open throttle your wheels can spin or you can drop so low speed is also where you have to be very careful with the throttle very careful and kind of spend time learning this because i have seen many people fall on u turns on big turn big bikes you know once even i fell on my r1 just taking a u turn near home that's the only fall i ever had so spend time at least be aware that got to be gradual on the throttle and have both your feet down both your feet it looks crazy are abhi seek raha hai gaadi chalana it look like that but keep both your feet down because you don't know which side you could fall so next you don't park on the slope yeah <laughs> big bikes you know these super bikes are not heavy they are just 180 kg or 190 kg but if you park your bike if you go somewhere if it's not even surface if it's like this just say even 2 3 inches into the front it's got a slope if you park your bike there you will not be able to pull it back alone you will be stuck there because the posture is like this you will not be able to pull the bike you will need someone to hey, you know he keeps helping me out all the time pjs he keeps pulling it back so because if you have a handle which is up here you can do it but when you are on the bike like this you cannot and it's a very bad idea that situation where you get out and you actually pull the bike out you know because If you lose balance, you'll drop the bike. So be very careful that you park on an even and flat surface. So I mean, you can probably park it like this a little bit, but not like this. You know, you'll not be able to get the bike out from parking. So heavier the bike, the tougher it is. Ulta, yeah. I mean, just remember that you know you will need someone to pull it out in case you park it uh, in a slope. 
All right, next. Yeah. Good looking bikes, exotic bikes, super bikes. Don't leave them unattended. You know, you might go to a cafe, coffee day, restaurant or anything, you know, park them outside and don't go away. Because number one, they're very good looking. People would, I mean, there's nothing wrong. People would want to come over, take a look at your motorbike. But till the time they're only taking a look at your motorbike, taking photographs, that's fine. But people can do some, you know, notorious stuff. I have had experiences where people have put, uh, you know, stones into the exhaust. The exhaust hole is this big. Okay. They put stones into it and go away. You can't get it out. It's stuck. Okay. If it's, I mean, you'll have to open up the whole thing. If the stone is stuck inside, you're done. And worst case, some people have been jealous and they've opened up the uh, oil filler cap and they put some sand in, into it. So these things can happen. And if they put sand into it, we are screwed completely. You know, and we won't even know that is a problem. We'll crank the bike and we'll go away and we are done. So, and or in case they cut off some wires or forget all that. I mean, if they don't do this, but if they sit on the bike, on the side stand, and if they break the side stand, the bike falls and they'll go away, they'll run away after that. Till the time your back fluids will leak out. So, it's not safe. You know, don't leave your motorbike unattended at all. I mean, any motorbike you should not do, but especially motorbikes which gather a lot of attention. I have not. Even if I'm sitting somewhere in a dabar somewhere outside, I keep looking all the time. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I don't discourage people getting close, taking photographs, but I say, please, don't sit on it or don't touch, you know. So, and you know how the stands are. They're very thin, they're very aerodynamic. If you sit on them, they will bend or crack. So, next. The invisible visor. Yes, another very important thing. This is applicable especially for night rides also. Where visors, a helmet visor, we neglect it very badly, right? I mean, any visor in the end, after some time, will get scratches. And a scratch will lead to glare. So when you're riding in the night with a visor, make sure, first of all, you should not ride with a tinted visor. And with a plain visor also, make sure it is a clean visor where the light is passing through you. Vision is clear else you'll get glare and it is terrible one more thing like uh, two three kinds of visors are there some uh, photochromatic black and complete white so what kind of uh, visor you prefer actually so i have two helmets dude my hjc mm -hmm. and the agv the hjc has a black visor use it in the day the agv has a tinted visor use it, i mean a transparent visor use it in the night you are having both the visors <laughs> if you are doing touring carry two okay. in the daytime tinted visor keep one in the back and in the night, if you, so first of all, night riding I discourage. I do very less night riding. But if you have to do it, if you are touring, if you have to get to your destination and you still have 100 kilometers more to go, if you have to ride in the night, keep one clear visor in your bag. It is very critical. You know, visors are easy. Just take them off and put on the clear visor and ride. And uh, fogging. You know, if you are riding early morning or when it's raining, your helmet will start to fog from inside. And that is dangerous. Really dangerous, you know. Because... The moment, see, fogging will happen when you're slowing down. On higher speeds, it will not because air is going in some way. So when you're slowing down, lesser than, say, 70, 80, all of a sudden, it'll, you can't see anymore. So probably sometimes you won't even get time to get the visor up. So what you can do, you can buy a anti-fog visor. You have to spend some money or there's an insert that you get, which is called anti-fog insert. You know, put it from inside, which kind of absorbs all the fog. Yeah, you can just Google it, anti-fog visor you know most of the helmets which are above 15,000 usually come with an anti flog or an insert so that's good to use it's very critical and uh, else you also get a spray from Makov which is expensive spray actually it's almost a thousand bucks a small bottle where you spray it inside and clean it with a cloth it's fine to ride fast not rash yeah so there's a very fine line between riding fast and rash you know, that is where our police are confused. You know, they look at us, are like, we are rash riders, bad riders. No, you can ride fast. In case the road permits, you know the road really well. Fine, you know, ride fast, accelerate fast. But riding rash, the difference between fast and rash is that you are riding in one lane, fast. You are not troubling others. Rash is cutting through people, you know, uh, kind of not caring, going from left, doing any kind of crazy thing. Where, see, for example, if you are riding a fast super bike, there is one guy, you know, going with his family on the bike. If you go from the left, bow, he gets scared. He'll, probably he'll fall also. So that is where you have to be careful. You have to give enough warning. 
or have enough distance and overtake him. So don't be rash on to others. So riding fast is absolutely fine. I ride fast all the time, but not rash. So you got it, right? So just understand that thing, R fast and rash. So that fine line we have to maintain. Next. Head on overtake me. Another very, very critical thing. I ride very fast on highways, but when it comes to see if there's no divider, if it's a two, two way road. What I do, if you are on a fast, powerful motorbike, you don't have to care about overtakings because you have all the power. And if in case I'm behind a truck or behind another car and I see another car coming from there, I don't go head on and take a left hand away. Because yeah, you have the power, but why I avoid that is that when you're overtaking, what if your engine cuts off for a second? Something can happen, right? Or your health or something. You're going head on. See this way, there's one car or truck here. You're going on to the right onto the other lane and there is something coming from there and you have to get onto the left if you fail to do it because of any reason your engine easing off or something you go straight into that and you're done no riding gear will save you nothing will save you so when you're on a fast bike overtake only if you don't see anything for a very very long time or just wait behind wait you have all the power don't take chances don't ever take don't think i can do it maybe i'll do it no just do it when you see nothing else there Best yeah. way to do it. Because you have so much power, you're not losing time, you'll capitalize. No, Achcha road aya, ride faster. You know, don't talk. Head on overtakes are critical. 90% accidents on highways happen that way only. Head on overtakes. So, simple. You see anything coming from there, it's too close, ease off. Stay behind this car. When things get clear, whatever, you know, if you're riding at 100 here, you can ride at 140 at that time if everything is clear. So, avoid that. Next. Stunting. Hmm? Stunting. Yeah. As you already mentioned, you know, we all like wheelies, toppies and everything, but they are dangerous, especially on a very powerful motorbike. On a motorbike which does not have too much power, too much torque, you open throttle, engage the clutch. Engage, usually the people say release clutch, but it's engage clutch. Engaging is, you know, releasing it, releasing lever. So when you do it on a motorbike which doesn't have too much power, nothing. Either it'll pop a wheelie or it'll not pop a wheelie. But if you do this on a thousand, you'll backflip. Things have happened, you know, there are videos on the internet, right? People try to do wah, pong, pong. it'll just backflip and you're done. If you fall that way, your back will break and we are done. That is it. So wheelies on very powerful motorbike, I mean, I, I don't do, you know. And as, see, public roads are not supposed to do anyway, but uh, just avoid it on high, very powerful motorbikes because, you know, they can basically do wheelie in any gear. Fourth gear also, they can do wheelie. So, be very, 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 just, just ignore it. If you want to learn wheelies, go join some, you know, stunt group in a private property somewhere, get a lower powered motorbike, understand how to do wheelies, but not on those things. Many people have backflipped, just type on internet, you know, wheelie fails, you will know. <laughs> you know so, so many wheelie fails, no? And stoppies also, oh God, the brakes are so good, you'll fall the other way only. So, next. Tank slappers, wobbles. Yeah. So, you heard about steering dampness on bikes. See, basically, the faster you go, during acceleration, these bikes accelerate like hell. 1000 cc's and all that. So, when you're accelerating, in first, second, first gear itself, you can do 150. So, during those accelerations, the front end is very light. Because power, I mean, it's rising, right? And, see, tank slapper, again, there's no clear explanation. It could be because of the surface. It could be because of the wheel alignment. I mean, alignment of your front, or it could be just some vortex, the you know air or anything. But your front can all of a sudden start to slap. You know, it can start to wobble, and it is a dangerous phenomenon. You type tank slappers on internet, and you will see the guy will be riding fine. Okay, all of a sudden, front will be going. And if you don't know what to do in that situation, we are done. So the best way to do is. Gradually dip the throttle. Gradually, not just stop. On any bike, anyway, one more thing he'll tell. Throttle on off have to be gradual. On, off. So, tank slapper, gradual. Don't don't try to brake. If you're thinking it's wobbling, don't try to. Because that will again kind of, you know, because you're trying to slow down the front wheel, don't do it. Just get the throttle down gradually. If you are lucky enough, the motorbike will get back to you know riding normally so anything more you want to add on tank slappers tank slappers are very unpredictable dude like yeah. very very unpredictable 
once you get into tank slapper the reaction time of you has to be very sharp otherwise you will fall tank slappers mainly i've seen tank slappers happen when people on a super bike itself they throttle the front wheel lifts they don't know it lifted maybe it's like this much off the ground yeah and then when it's landing it's like this way mm. it lands there and then tries to get back into place and that starts a tank slapper over there you got to be so, very careful high end bikes have steering dampeners you know there is there'll be a, like a shock absorber here what it will do when that wobble starts no it will not let it go left and right so uh, wildly so it will slow down that thing the moment a tank slapper sl- uh, starts it will kind of restrict it just like a french shock you know so but i have seen tank slappers on s1000 rrs also despite having a very good steering dampener you know so we don't know just remember that something like this can happen see every point i'm speaking google it you know there'll be a lot much better explanation about it also so next eyesight extremely important to ride fast motorbikes as i said reaction times you have very little reaction time to give a small example if you are riding at 200 km h you are covering 100 meters in a second so if someone is going at 200 km h from here 100 meters is a long distance no you won't even see him boom gone where is the bike so you are riding so fast and see we all can have some you know uh, kind of issues with our sight right i mean vision so we got to get it checked and if we think because we don't know sometimes we think our vision is fine but it might not be you know the far vision near vision and in case we need corrective lenses what happens if wearing a very nice proper snug fit helmet we can't wear our glasses so i've seen many riders because they can't wear glasses inside they take the glasses off and ride but it's very dangerous because the eyesight has to be bang on it has to be good so if you cannot wear your spectacles put on contact lenses but don't ride with you know issues with your eyesight not on those bikes your reaction times have to be very very fast so i think i am done any more points questions please yeah, ask like oh yeah, yeah yeah critical thing one more thing what i do you know we might but we we might wear the best riding gear best leather jacket best leather pants everything but if we end up putting cell phones like this in pocket and ride no in case we fall imagine this can go in somewhere <laughs> and we are done okay and or it can break your pelvis it's very hard right the phone imagine falling like this so phone and wallets keep it under the ac or a tank bag never on you no city rides kind of fine but fast rides never so because best riding gear you wear we're wearing putting something hard you know or oh, and especially you put it on the f- jacket pocket no it will break your rib cage if you fall no good jacket but if you fall imagine that will break your rib cage it's sharp sharp edges you know cell phones have got so i always avoid it you got enough space yeah put it back there wrap it up and put it inside that so anything more i got a simple question yeah yeah please yeah like, i have i should know what uh, when to use a high beam and low beam Good. The, uh, most people never give me a sure answer. Yeah, they assume that this should be. Yeah. Nigel. Ah, what? High beam, low beam. Do you need a night ride? Always low beam, dude. On a highway over. Here. Highway when there's no oncoming traffic, you can put high beam. If there's a guy in front of you, low beam. If you're even behind a guy, put low beam because his mirrors are probably deflecting that into his eyes. But one thing is, uh, I can't depend uh, exactly say that the road will be same way as up so north. So what I do is when up I close, no. When I feel the road is unpredictable, I pa- I use the pass. I see for like two seconds, three seconds, and then I shut it off again. I never ride in high beam all the way, unless it's like two, three in the morning. There's nobody on the roads, and then I can use it happily. Otherwise, Probably just put on the high beam, analyze the road, turn it off, get on to low beam. You know, because high beam we need only to analyze. And you know, all far the distance. Mostly have adjustable headlights now, so if you can't see with the low beam, you can lift it up or change the bulb also. Yeah. So basically, analyze the road. Put on if you're on a highway. Put on the high beam. Analyze the road. If you say ah, it's cool, get back onto. Unless there's absolutely no one, you can use whatever <laughs> you want. And questions? Put your, put your. We have him. You know, before we let him go, we should ask everything. <laughs> uh, also, for long rides now. Yeah. Road. Can you repeat? What should I check for the bikes? Long ride bike checkup. Basic checkup, dude. Make sure your chain is looped tight. Okay, brake pads. 
both are good yeah brake oils are good your engine has oil basically bike should be serviced as they all say service it i have a different checklist for servicing everything has to be set your gear has to be ready I always do a pre checklist before you before the night before you leave and the morning before when the bike is warming up do a walk around always good to get your tires checked also before you head out on the long ride even though you feel day the previous night once again it's good to check it in the morning that's it one more important thing you know what we do sometimes before going on a long ride or touring we think are we'll give it for service we give it for service and instantly next day we go on a ride no don't do it ride your bike because we don't know what they have done service center we have given it but have they fastened things well is something leaking most of things have gone wrong after the bike has come back from the service center you know because we don't know right usne kuch khol diya theek se he hasn't fitted it back so ride it well ride it at least for 50 odd kilometers see everything is working fine and then only hit the highway because we don't want to go there and realize are that guy didn't put this nut at all you know something is leaking out now so that is important too that thing happened to me yeah. i gave my bike for servicing and after servicing uh, from coming from tolly choki to gachiboli at gachiboli i felt like some there is a power loss i cannot have means i'm not having that pickup from a bike mm. then i took the bike again back to showroom they checked they checked some uh, exhaust sensor is there oxygen sensor right yeah. so they replaced that sensor actually okay. in rs200 that sensor is somewhere here. got it got it o2 sensor yep. yeah mm. so they replaced that sensor and after that uh, i got the pickup mm. the desired mm. pickup actually so very critical to do that and of course as you mentioned check your brake pads it's very easy to check it you know right just see it from there if you're going on a long ride if life has to be at least 50% of the brake pads else you know what will happen you'll damage your rotors this is so. inside you know <laughs> this this one is a brake pad okay. so put a torch you can see how much it has left oh. see uh, between the metal rotor and the pad there's be that friction surface okay. that is what generates friction so if it's less if you're mm. going on a very long ride you might wear it out and if it wears out you'll cut your rotor okay. you know so because that is also metal metal touching metal we That's are done yeah also understand the life expectancy of a tire like when should i change very important question i was you know thinking to do a video on this very critical on a performance oriented bike don't be stingy on changing tires you know because tires are extremely important many times tires look fine are uh, looks like see for example on a duke 390 it suggested that after you reach 8000 be ready with the money to buy a rare tire you know i mean you can ride the tire for 12 13 14 000 km also but it's not worth it you already lost see tires have different compounds at different levels so when a brand new tire the outer component on a duke 390 on a mezzella will be soft so it will get maximum traction but after riding about 5000 km depending how you are riding you are already starting to lose the main soft component then you are getting to the harder one and say at about 8 or 9000 km you are getting to almost the bottom of the tire and what happens when you have already got to about 80% of the life of the tire the tire is prone to punctures because you know uh, it's very close to that steel radial okay and even a sharp stone can make a hole in the tire so uh, i would say on uh, something like let's take an example of the duke 390 rare the moment you reach 8000 km keep your money ready and analyze it how it is i change at 8000 only so it can also do 10000 i change at 8000 so get keep your tires in shape and also always check the side walls side walls a tire means this this area okay this area side wall is what is holding the tire onto the rim the strength it is that is taking all the pressure so check for cracks this is very critical so what happens sometimes we have bikes we don't ride much we keep them at home so if the tire is 2 or 3 years old you have only ridden say 3000 km or 4000 km but it can develop cracks because of weathering it's rubber right rubber with rain heat and everything it can develop cracks So put a torch and check for cracks. Even minor cracks, not done. You on especially on side walls, get a new tire. If there's a puncture, if you can't afford a new tire, don't do that. You know uh, the plug wala puncture. Do a mushroom puncture. There's something called a mushroom puncture where you can Google it. Yeah, they take out the whole tire from the wheel and they put a mushroom kind of an insert from inside. So it has a mushroom patch where you know it's not just that threat what they put so this holds on much better so in any way always say the uh, plug thing what we put it 
is an only emergency thing. If you're on a highway, do it yourself. Do the plug thing. Go home. Find a place where they do a mushroom puncher and do a mushroom puncher from inside. What they do, they get the tire out. They clean the surface from inside. They drill a hole. They make a hole bigger, and they put high-end industrial level glue and put the mushroom. So the mushroom sticks really well. So it's like 50% as good as the tire itself. You are like reconstructing the tire. So do that. Front. Be very, very because motorcycle is all about front only. There's nothing about rear. Rear only spins, but the control is all front. So make sure you tires are in shape. Bro, mine yeah. is a Mazelar M5. Can okay. I upgrade to M7 for track? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely you can. With it, you? RC 390. Okay, okay.